Hey guys. Okay, just checking if you guys can see me. Oh, I think my thing's frozen. Here we go. Okay, so let's just get this going. I hope you guys can see me fine. All right, I'm gonna get cracking. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about direct in motion capture. And um, so, you know, there's been some amazing presentations so far throughout the day, which talks about, you know, creating the shots. For me, it's really about my job as a director, direct in motion capture. So as you saw in the in the trailer or the, the sizzle trailer for you guys, you know, we're still in, we're still in production, but it's essentially my third feature film and it's a sci-fi action. It's all done in Unreal Engine, it's final pixels and we're delivering 4K HDR. We're also very lucky to be um, and very fortunate to be um, an Epic Meg Grant recipient as well. But just an FYI for all of those who are probably wondering, the Epic Meg Grant was a tiny fraction of what the overall budget was. So just, just so you know. Okay, so um, I always like to start off these presentations like big props to my team. And you can see we're a very tiny team. This is the core production team in terms of the visuals. Of course, we have an amazing sound designer, sound team, music composer, um, Edward White, um, and a bunch of other people that are behind the scenes. But in terms of the main production core team, yeah, this is kind of, this is us. You know, there's me who's directing it, producing it, doing all the shot creation. We have Alex, who's based in Montreal, who's this fantastic animator, who's doing all the facial animation for us. We have Mark Chen, who's also doing shot creation for us. Gabriella Mocap. Andrea, who's our pipeline character designer, and a bunch of a million other things. We have Ace, who's doing mocap, and we have Sam, who does our environments and also is coding our game version as well. And of course, we have Paula, who is the producer in keeping all the finance and schedule together. So that's essentially, you know, our core team. And obviously, we ramp up and down when we need to. Okay, so um, the way we approach animation, well, the way I approach animation as as a as a director is we have a very agile production approach. So for those of you who don't know what Agile is, Agile, you know, we we have Waterfall and Agile. Waterfall is like a linear process where you do your storyboards, your animatic, you get those things signed off. Then you go to layout, you get that signed off. You have all these various pipeline steps to get it signed off, right? You have the bigger projects, which is which is all great. For us, because we're a small team and you know our, our budgets and schedules are, are quite are quite tight, you know, we have very much of an agile approach, which is like you know, we, we keep working on stuff. We just throw stuff in the edit and we just keep refining it as we go along. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons for that. But for us, you know, we have this ethos through the whole team, which is progression over perfection. So we don't spend ages trying to get that one perfect shot looking great before we move on. We are, we block out something, put it in the edit, we keep moving on. And then we, you know, we go back and just update it and we just keep moving. And the reason we do that is because our characters our, all our assets are constantly being updated, so we have a really good version control via the force. But also our animation and our mocap, you know, we keep adding layers and layers on top of the animation to just keep getting it better. So we feel progression over perfection is a better approach. Okay, so before I start approaching um, doing any kind of motion capture, I'll just break down the script. And that is pretty much a familiar thing most directors do, whether you're doing animation and live action, regardless if you're using Unreal or not Unreal, you still have to break down the script. Now, you know, a lot of this process I'm gonna tell you now is doesn't involve Unreal Engine so much. A lot of it is, you know, while your assets are being built, while your characters are being built, you start breaking down the scenes. And, you know, a feature film is like 90 pages plus, you know, ours is like 106 pages long, you know, a page a minute, you know, if you, you know, if you look at it industry standard, like Final Draft. And um, so it takes a while to break down the entire script. So what I do is I tend to like, break it down into reels. So we have like six or seven reels. Each reel is like between 15 to 18 minutes long, sometimes some of the 10 minutes long. And we do that for a lot of reasons. We do that because firstly, <laughs> mentally, I need to like be able to focus on chunks as opposed to the whole thing. Um, it's easy for milestones, it's easy for scheduling, but also easy for data management as well. We know when to scale up and down. We also, you know, dealing with hard drives. We use WD Black for all our hard drives. Um, we know how much space we need. Um, so that's why we break it up. So, you know, for example, for this, we started breaking down rules one and two. So first one I do, obviously, you know, you read the script a million times until you get it right. Um, in my case, I wrote it with the writer, so that's a bit easier. Um, but then what I start doing in terms of motion capture, of course, there's other breakdowns, by the way, guys, you know, there's, which I'm not going to cover in here, but, you know, I have to break down how many environments there are, how many characters there are, how many props there are, you know, um, how many vehicles there are and all of that, which stuff needs physics, which stuff don't need physics. 
you know, which stuff we're going to see up close, which stuff is background. That's a whole, that's like a million spreadsheets. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of people don't realize when, when you're directing specifically animation, because it's so data driven, there's a lot of spreadsheets as a director you have to be involved in. It's not just like, you know, doing all the fun stuff. Um, but this stuff that may not be fun is equally just as important because without all of this um, organization and structure, later on, you're gonna find that you're gonna thank yourself for being structured because it makes it much more smoother. So first thing I do is I start breaking down the amount of characters and I start to see what animation I need. Now we have a great motion capture library that we've bought like asset, you know, like sort of library kits we use. And so things like walk in, unless it's a specific walk, I know I can just use a walk cycle. I don't need to go and capture that. And the other thing also you've got to remember, because this is an independently financed project, you don't have the luxury to go out and mocap every single thing in the movie. And you start to start having, you got to start thinking a bit smartly how you do it. So first thing you know, I start doing is I make sure my scene numbers are in my breakdown. Now your scene number, as um, as small as it sounds, is probably the most important element in production is your scene number. And you generate your scene number from your script. So if you, you know, you can use Celtic or whatever software you use, but I use Final Draft. So in Final Draft, you just make sure you go to production and you just make sure you say, um, make scene numbers visible. Very, very important when you're sending scripts out to actors, you're sending scripts out to artists, to financiers, anyone, make sure it has the scene number on it because this is the main point of communication you're going to be talking about. You're not going to say, oh, you know that scene in Max's room? Because there are like 20 scenes in Max's room, right? So you're going to be very specific, your scene number. So, you know, for example, like scene 92 here, you know, quick note, you know, this takes place in Max's room. Um, what scenes I could reuse? So, you know, at, what I'm showing you here is obviously a script breakdown I started to do sort of like later on, like on a mid flow, where I had already done a bunch of shots. So I can always say, hey, we can reuse this scene. We can reuse this mocap. We can retarget the mocap that we did on one character. We can use that mocap on another character because it's it's the same skeleton. Um, so those are the kind of things you start thinking about when you're breaking down the script. And yeah, I use something called Evernote, you know, just, but you can use Word, Notepad, whatever you want, right? But just keep it broad stroke when you're doing your first script breakdown, just keep it broad stroke. So you just kind of get an idea overall what, it's, what it is that needs to be done. And then create the shot list. So then I go into, into Excel, yay, fun. Um, and I create a spreadsheet. And my spreadsheet is super simple, man. Like, you know, I have my scene shot number from one column, I have the character in another column, and then I've got the action in another column. And the thing that's very important, you know, I think it helps coming from a writer's background is keep all your descriptions as succinct as possible so that your spreadsheet isn't this big, massive essay. And um, and again, like, you know, I generate my shot numbers right at this stage. So in this case, you know, scene 78, which is scene 78 in the script and shot 210, 220. And for, you know, obviously a lot of you on this, on this session listening and probably come from visual effects. So you're so used to shot numbers being 10, 20, 30, 40. And the reason we do that, because we want to add another shot in between 10 and 20, we can do shot 11, 12, 13, 14, um, as opposed to doing one, two, three, four, five, and you won't be able to sh add shots in between. So that's kind of like your standard VFX production, which I kind of bought from my VFX background. But you can see here, like, you know, you start putting that together. This essentially becomes your Bible for motion capture. This starts, this is stuff you start talking with your motion capture artists, going, look, this is the kind of quantity of shots. and this becomes also your editorial shot list. And how I mean from that is um, I then put that into an edit and I'll start just flicking through it. Now, you know, back in the day, this used to be called the paper edit, where you do the paper edit on like, you know, like post-it notes or, or cards, where I put it in the edit and then I can put it in between scenes as well. Now, the reason I do this is because, and again, this is a personal thing. I'm not saying this is the way it has to be done. For me, I think editorially, everything I think editorially. And the other thing also about this project, which is a, a little bit unique, I find, is we recorded all of our ADR way in advance before we started any um, any actual main shots, you know, because I knew what the performance were. I treated it like a radio play in a sense. Um, and this is the first pass of voices. Obviously, we'll all come back later on once the animation is done, do additional voices. But what was really cool is having the ADR voices, I could start cutting the voices in with the, with the text edit. And therefore, I start getting the flow of things. I can't see how much mocap I need, how much mocap I don't need. And I feel like if I didn't do this, I would be just capturing tons of mocap and then figuring it out in Unreal, which I find is a luxury that I don't have um, because time is, you know, it's the essence. 
but this is a really good way to start seeing your movie without doing any actual animation work um just by just putting the text in there and then you, know, you start to realize oh i need additional shot here for additional coverage you start putting that in there and once you're happy with that you can then start do your layout and blocking and by that time you know your artist has already done a rough mock-up or or pretty good mock-up of the environment in this case it's kind of rough mock-up we're in unlit mode and we've got a first pass of the characters we can just drop in and you just drop them in you just drop them in and sometimes i'll just in fact a lot of the times i just render out the unlit version or just this version of the shot where it's just a basic camera with the characters in there and i just do that um and it's in the edit but this becomes useful because then you start to figure out your blocking and this is very important because in our case we only had one xn suit so you know we we're dealing with one xn artist or uh, performer so that person will play multiple roles sometimes. So they need to know exactly where people are standing. And then on their end, they'll block their area in a similar sort of way. So, you know, your eye line's correct, you know, your blocking is correct. And I pretty much do this for all the scenes that have, you know, quite a lot of movement in the scene. If there's a shot of someone just standing like mid shot talking, I don't need to block that out. You know, you just capture it as it is. But for something like this, where the environment plays a big part of, you know, the the choreography, then I think it's important to block this out. And you keep it simple. You don't try to go too crazy. You know, I think this sequence here in the helicopter, you know, positioning of people seated, it's very important because then when they're talking and when they're interacting, all that stuff comes in very useful. Um, of course, if you had multiple XN suits, you know, you know, the blocking comes in useful, but you know, it's it's much more easier. With this, this comes in useful because we're doing single XN suits. Um, here you go, this is another idea for blocking as well, where the character walks away from the diner, all of that stuff. Okay, so in terms of motion capture, we did um, we did three style of motion capture on this project. Uh, first, we did on-site motion capture, which is in my hometown, London. And um, second, we did remote motion capture session with um, Gabriella in Florida. And the third motion capture, which was all facial motion capture in Montreal. So we are kind of an international project, I guess. So this is um, on-site motion capture here, give you an idea. Um, this was done at, um, at a post facility, by the way. So this is actually a grading suite. We just used the space. And what was really cool about doing on-site motion capture is I can just get in there as well and start acting it out. And you have a much more um, much more intimate um, experience. Um, you could try things out. And what's great also is I'm able to see a lot of this stuff on the motion live. This is one of the great things about using Xsense is that you have the motion live and you can see it. So not only am I um, directing the actor on in the space, I'm also directing that to while looking at what the skeleton is doing. And it's also very good because then I know how much work I'll need to do later in terms of post-processing, but also when I need to adjust the skeleton bones, I can see that. I don't have to wait until I get the data and get all these like surprises. Oh, the hand doesn't really match properly or, and so on. And of course, you know, we're constantly updating the weapons in the game as well as the movie. So, you know, we have to be quite flexible. But this is, um, this is a really good way of directing because um, you can see here, I'm mostly focused on the XN skeleton here. The other thing about directing actors, um, which is quite an important thing I want to talk about, you're not just directing the motion. You know, the, a lot of time my job is providing as much um, information to the actors, whether it's the character's backstory. You know, the actors, you know, especially someone like Ace Rule, who's this like amazing motion capture artist who's worked on tons of Hollywood movies and he's like very experienced. He always has questions of like, you know, why am I doing this motion? You know, what is my intent? And you can see here, a lot of it is me having conversations um, and breaking up the mocap in sections in a way that allows the actor to really dr soak in the character moment. Um, you know, even simple things like someone drinking a coffee cup, I'm drinking in a coffee cup. Um, and, um, you know, what, 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 is, what is that person's motivation? What is, what is that person going through? What was the scene before that that led to this scene? So you, know, you need to be in tune as a director for, with the story, but also you kind of need to give a little space for the actor to kind of interpret your intent. Because, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a fan of working with, with actors that will bring a lot to the scene and bring a lot of ideas to the scene. I'm not a fan of like, hey, I need you to do exactly this, walk, two steps forward, turn left and say this line. To me, you know, and again, this is a personal opinion, but that feels too much like puppeteering. For me, like, you know, I'm, this is me showing how the shit version is. <laughs> Don't do that version, make it better. That's usually my approach. Um, but communication is a very big thing when you're directing um, actors with mocap. And what's really great is that you can play back the data you've captured and they can watch it back as well. We also have, um, we usually use GoPros or in my case, I had a Sony um, camera. 
just recording witness camera stuff. And they can also play back and watch their performance as well as look at the skeleton. And I find it's very useful. It's kind of like playback, uh, which is, um, I find it, it allows me to have a conversation with the actor much better. And you know, a lot of the time I write this, the description of what I want from the actor, but for me, the best moments when I find those magic moments for the actor. So that's one of the things, that's the beautiful thing about doing on-site motion capture. But of course, you don't always have the luxury to have it on-site motion capture. You know, for working with someone like Ace, who's constantly busy working on some of the biggest movies, it's it's a blessing to try to grab him when I can. But there's a lot of other mocap where it doesn't require so much intimate action or intimate conversation, but you still need to be there to direct them. And you, know, you can use anyone that has an XN suit. And that's the beautiful thing about XN is the fact that, you know, it really, you know, like Alvaro mentioned democratization, which is absolutely right. But also for me, it gives me the freedom to work with who I think is the right person for the job, as opposed to working with someone because they just happen to have an XN suit or they ha just happen to be a motion capture facility in my area or in London. For me, I want to work with the best person. And I've been following Gabriella's work for a long time. And um, and I, I love her attitude in terms of she's a storyteller as well. So with so with Gabriella, we did we were we did XN body capture, but as well we did hand capture using the Manus gloves, which is amazing. Now the way I work with Gabriella is kind of interesting because she has Unreal Engine open sometimes, and she'll have a live view open, and I'll be able to see both, and she processes the data for me as well. And you can see here, this is an example of a motion capture session. Um, so a lot of times I don't really look at Gabby you know, on her webcam, I'm looking at this. This is what I'm directing this. And it's great because it, you know, I can then move the camera. So you can share in Zoom, you can share control. So I can then move the camera around while she's doing her motion. And I can really see all the angles. And that's that's a testament to XN software actually. And this is exactly what my Zoom screen looks like when I'm doing remote um, session. And this is the same sort of Zoom. This is what Gabby sees as well. So we have obviously my shot list. And then we have the um, the live view window in the back there. And then we have our um, our layout block in here. And, you know, obviously the bigger the monitor, the better. So don't do this on a laptop. I usually have it plugged into a bigger monitor. And then um, we just do the session and it's great. And then, you know, she'll, she'll tick off the stuff that's being done. I can make amendments for any additional stuff she's done, which is cool. I can put it in the shot list. It becomes much more of a live real-time event. And even though she's in Florida, I'm in London, it works really great. Um, so yeah, so remote remote motion capture is actually great. Cause then I can just, you know, we'll do the session like today. And then the next morning I wake up and on Dropbox, all of the data has been processed. It's amazing. Like it's great. I don't have to wait for days or anything like that. Um, sometimes I can't be there to, you know, to direct certain small things. Um, and, but I need the motion capture and I'm very specific what I need. This is some specificity here. Um, instead of writing a long email saying, hey, I need this to happen and that to happen, I tend just to record a version of myself doing it. And this is kind of cringe. I don't know why I'm showing you guys this, but it's so cringe. But this is basically me acting it out like what I'm looking for. And I'll just comp like, this like the elevator doors in this case. I'll just do something in Premiere, comp two things in. It's kind of like really bad tech biz. But the interesting thing is it helps someone like Gabriella understand what I'm looking for. And then she's not second guessing. She goes, oh, okay, I see what he's, I see what he's going for here. Right, you know, obviously I've got much more room than this guy. I'm going to be able to do a better run. Um, but I think as a director, the more you communicate, not just verbally, but physically, because motion capture is a very physical thing. Um, so it's good to stay in shape if it helps, like do lots of stretches. Um, I find that, you know, the more you the more you act silly, the more you provide confidence to the motion capture performer. And the more there, there's a there's a, a level of um, level of trust the fact that, you know, as a director, you're willing to put yourself out there and be vulnerable, I mean, really vulnerable, as you can see, and you're expecting the same from the actor. So I think that's very important uh, to have that level of vulnerability it's with your with your actors. Uh, so I also mentioned facial performance. So this is Alex in, um, in Montreal using the live link to do um, performance capture. And yeah, clearly he's having way too much fun doing this. Um, but what's really cool is because obviously the time difference in Montreal, um, and but of course, you know, Alex has worked on shows like What If, the Marvel animated shows, there's a level of trust in there. So I would have a conversation with him, talk about the character, you know, for example, this is Nurse Peters, who's a bit of a goofy type character. And, you know, he, you can see, I don't know if you can see here on his laptop, but he's watching the dailies. So we render out dailies every 
every night actually i render a daily but on on the channel uh, private channel and then um he'll watch that and see you know what the intent of the shot is and he'll then do the facial capture because he's just doing facial he needs to kind of see what the body is as well and how do we communicate well well we don't do the zoom thing because obviously alex wants to be he's kind of like a method actor animator he wants to be in the zone so what he'll do is he'll just do a bunch of whatsapps and you can see here there's like a little conversation going going on here like you know he's like saying i feel this guy's insecure so he'll be looking at scared until someone immediately sees him and he smiles so he wants to be liked so that's his interpretation i'm like yeah show me and he'll just record it on his whatsapp and send it over to me and yeah you know, and i'll just get tons of these and i'll just give him feedback so my point is your communication doesn't need to be as flashy it doesn't need to be like you need like shotgun or f track i mean these are great tools but you know sometimes a simple video sh screen share or a simple like whatsapp with a video clip or a recording is much quicker and the thing about when you're working in independent films is speed and efficiency is super important you don't want to be going through all this process just to get your feedback or hear feedback so i always find if there's different ways you know we're using slack we use discord we're using sync sketch we use um google sheets whatever it you know whatever it is to help communicate is very important and that's in a crux, that's your job as a director, is to communicate and get the best out of your team members. Okay, so now we're getting to the Unreal Engine side of things. So obviously, once you've done your mocap, it's very important to label stuff. And I've already, I keep drilling all about it. And you're going to hear that's going to be the mantra through this whole session. It's label. Now, the way I labeled the, the script breakdown, the way I labeled my shot list, it's the same way someone like Gabriella, who's doing the remote um mocap she's labeling her files the same except in this case you know if something like c92 shot 10 it'll be c92 shot 10 underscore a for the character Ava or underscore l for the character leon so that when i get the mocap data back which is by the way i get the data back with the data on um on the epic skeleton i don't get it on the characters or anything like that and there's a reason for that the reason why is because we're constantly updating our characters and at the same time we want to be in a position where we build a library of stuff so a lot of times i'm using mocap for one character i'm using the same mocap on the other character and it means that i can retarget that myself i don't need to get gabby to do that gabby can just focus on getting the best processing done after the mocap session but you can see here everything is labeled accordingly and labeling is super important because you're going to get to the point where you're like this is a 90 minute plus movie you're gonna have a lot of motion capture data okay so you don't want to be scrolling through looking for peter's underscore run version two or something so you want to be able to type it and if you type in c92 underscore 10 you'll get all the mocap for c92 c92 shot 10 but if you do c92 underscore shot 10 underscore l for leon then you'll get all the leon mocap now not only is that super important for me so that i can get on and just do the work but also it's important when i bring other artists someone like mark who's doing shot creation or even someone like andrea who's creating the characters and wants to test the animation he can go and do that and that's very important um yeah a typical shot setup on my side is pretty much let me see if i can run through this to show you what i mean i mean what i do first off before i do any mocap is i just bring in the characters in the t-post and sometimes like i said i'll animate the cameras render out put it in the edit so you see the first fast edit just people with t-poses doesn't matter as long as i've got a, something in my edit it's better than just having the text all blank right so that's the whole progression over perfection but then what I, once I've, I've got my mocap, I scroll through my shots and again, my shots are all labeled accordingly. And I find the mocap that I want, retarget it to the characters you can see here. Um, I'm not gonna do a whole session of retarget because Alvaro has done an amazing session on that. Um, and then I just start positioning my characters in there and then start putting it in there. And then what we end up doing sometimes also is we, we, we adjust the lighting on the characters. We built, um, our pipeline's built on layers. So our pipeline's designed in a way that we can do, we bring a mocap for the body, mocap for the hand separately, we bring a mocap for the face separately, and they're all assigned to individual sockets, which means that I don't need to wait for, for um, Alex's facial capture to be done for me to do the shot. I can go in and do the shot as it is and then get the mocap data later and apply it on the face. Same with the hands. If the hands are not perfect, like at the time of doing them, whether on site with Ace or remotely via with gabby if the hand isn't perfect because of the gun or i decide to change it midway that's okay because then we you know we'll, we'll do another session with just hands or we use reillusion gesture plugin and i apply the hand specific hand motion for the hand socket so yeah it's a pipeline we develop 
for like six or seven months, took us a while to get there. But it means it allows me and any artist to jump in and make changes instantly without breaking the flow of the entire scene and to be very specific in what you change. Here's another idea of a typical shot again, where I'll go in, same process again, go in, and this is the case of Max, find Max's um, animation, bring him in there, bring it in. Um, we also use Trello, by the way, guys. So Trello is really good. Trello is just a way we assign everyone shots. I'm even assign myself shots as well. Um, I always put little notes in there. And again, communication is super, super important. But once I find my shot, I bring it into sequencer, uh, you know, do the retarget, boom, super quick, position it nicely. And then I can go in and tweak things like, you know, I can do eye blinks if I want to, because we have controls in the sequence of eye blinks, which we've created. Um, and that has always been my pet peeve when I do facial capture, is I don't want them to blink at a certain time. So obviously when Alex is doing facial capture, he does his blink because he's in performance mode, but I can go in and I can adjust the blinks if I want to. And that's, um, that's a great freedom to have as a hands-on director, but also it's a great freedom for anyone on my team to go in and make, you know, polished final changes to shots. So um, one of the sequences I worked on last week was uh, a 1,000 plus frame shot, called like a one a single take action shot. I'm a huge fan of doing those kind of shots. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of what uh, how crazy it can be. But again, having clean mocap from something like Xsend and labeling your shit is really important because now you can see here I'm scrolling through my sequencer file. I don't know if you guys can see. Hopefully you can. But you know it really is my sequencer file is a. <laughs> It's it's a work of art because there's so many keyframes, so many layers, and it's a lot of choreography. But I mean, real time, you know, I'm moving the camera around while doing all the action, swapping mocap, you know, swapping facial expressions, you know, bringing, you know, there's a lot of cheat going on here, by the way. Like, I don't really have like 20 guys running at the same time getting beaten up. What I do is, you know, I play the camera. So when I move the camera down, now at this point, right at this point here, I'm swapping the, the data. And I'm moving the position. And when I'm, and then when that guy dies down, oops, sorry. And when that guy dies down, um, down here, I'll play it. So right here, uh, let's move it here. Sorry. Uh, here we go. So around here, this is kind of like smoke and mirrors. It's like kind of what they do in live action. But what's really cool is, um, I can hide stuff like when the camera's not looking at it. But also, one thing I want to show off is the fact that I've got a full lit environment here with fire and lots of geometry. And I'm able to, you know, choreograph an action like I'm on set. Sometimes what I do is I tend to block out all of my shots before I put a camera in. So I kind of like do like a layout where I just bring the camera up, play out the sequence. And then while I'm playing it, I'm bringing the camera and finding the shot. So I have the shot on loop and I just find the shot. Um, sometimes it's really great because I really feel like I'm in the action. Sometimes I'd be very specific. But essentially, that is how all the shots are put together. You know, clean mocap, good labeling you know, structured organize, organization in your folders. You know, we have a folder here called cinematics and each cinematic folder has got its own scene numbers. We have a folder for animation. Each animation has got its own character folders. You set all of that stuff at the start. And yes, it's a drag because you want to go straight in and start animating, having fun. But you spend some time setting that stuff up. It means later on, you can spend your time being creative. You don't have to worry. You know, I can get anyone to come in and jump into a shot. I don't need to worry about telling them where stuff is because everything is labeled and organized accordingly. Um, and that's basically directing animation, guys. You know, it really is. The, that's the crux of it. Um, lastly, I just kind of want to always share my kind of like my my four pillars, I say, which is, you know, you always keep learning. Every single day I am learning new things. Like, you know, you'll never know it all. And I think the day I think I know it all is when I decide not to be a filmmaker. But every project is new. In fact, Every week we're finding new things. Like for example, that single one shot I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to have 20, 30 SWAT guys on, on the roof. I realized, you know, it's gonna be a performance hit. So you start thinking of new ways of cheating. Yeah, you know, as we move the camera, we swap, we swap the SWAT team animation behind the camera and bring it back in when the camera's here. Um, don't be finding new technology. You know, just a FYI, but like I only learned on Real Engine sort of like December, no, October 2019 only because I wanted to do previews for one of the live action films I was supposed to be directing. Um, and if I had that mentality about, hey, I'm a director, I don't need to use this stuff, I can just hire a VFX team and do that, I don't think I'll have a career like I have today where I'm directing big game cinematics and I'm directing an animated film at my production company and a video game. So technology is something you should always look at. Don't be afraid of it. You know, Don't look at it as like, oh, it's not your job. 
yeah, even if you're not going to use it, have an understanding of it. You know, lastly, be brave and bold. And believe me, making a movie is about being brave. Like constantly, you're constantly trying to convince financiers to trust in your vision. I know Alvaro touched on that um, on the last part of his talk, but it really is about you know having a level of control for yourself as a as a creative, but also being being brave enough to open up for feedback, open up you know to listen to ideas. And it's bold. And also, lastly, never give up. This is the friggin' creative industry. Every single project, you're constantly pushing a boulder uphill. That's what it is. Um, and I'm not just talking about the production side. I'm talking about, you know, before you even get your movie greenlit, you're constantly hustling, you know, to get people on, to get finances on, get actors on. You are constantly going to have a lot of ups and downs. I mean, this project has so many ups and downs, but that is the process of filmmaking. And if you have the right tools like Xsense, which makes motion capture so easy to literally put on the suit and capture, that alleviates that process a bit better and makes it a little bit more smoother. But yeah, just never give up. Lastly, um, I'm very prolific on <laughs> online, some of you may know. And the cool thing about this project is because we are the main producers, only two producers on this, me and myself, uh, myself and Paula are the main producers, and we have other small equity financiers. We don't have crazy embargoes. So we constantly share tons of behind the scenes on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We constantly share. And I believe the reason we do that for two reasons. Firstly, I want to give back to the community to show people like, you know, how I'm doing it. Cause I wish I was able to see that when I was starting my career in film. But secondly, I really want to start the audience investing in the project at this early on, start building up your fan base. It's kind of like what we do in video games, right? You know, start doing pre-alpha releases and so on but you don't really get that in a movie because you can't really do that in a movie, like release a pre-alpha version of your movie. You know, you can't do that. So what you do is you share as much behind the scenes, a lot of progress. And I think in the world of real-time animation, that's very possible compared to live action. So um, that's my session in a nutshell. So now I'm hoping you're going to bombard me with tons of questions because I'm an open book. Thank you. Well, what a way to end the day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Haas. It was a very inspirational talk uh, that you did for sure. I actually really loved the part where you mentioned that if you act silly as a director, then you put confidence in the people that need to do stuff. And I think that really emphasizes that it's all a team effort at the end of the day. So the better you can work with everybody, then, uh, well, I mean, the better the results in the end will be, of course. Absolutely. Uh, one thing to add as well is that uh, we can actually see that there is quite some excitement for Rift, so definitely take that uh, to your side as well. So that's good, to, definitely good to hear. Um, so we do have a, a few questions uh, from the audience. So uh, how complex is the cleaning up of the mockup data for a smooth animation? Yeah, that's a really good question. That really depends on what the action is. Like we find that walk cycles, funny enough, walk cycles are probably the most trickiest because mm. it depends what your character is doing. Like, you know, for example, one of our characters were wearing heels, but when Gabriella did the mocap, she's not wearing heels. So when you retarget it, you're going to get some feet deformation, which again, you're dealing with data guys. So you can fix all of that stuff, but it takes time. So, but if you've got a lot of, um, a lot of like crazy movement that may cause arm to intersect, because like your, your epic skeleton is one thing, but your character is another thing. Like you may have, you know, clothes or bigger arms or maybe a big giant weapon that when you're moving the arm around, it may intersect. So that's a level of cleanup. But what we try to do is we try not to get too bogged down with positioning hands and stuff in the processing on the XN side. We just make sure we get clean, you know, 240 hertz, you know, um, 100 frame plus you know, speed, frame rate so that we can then slow things down if we need to. What we tend to do is, you know, Gabby's really good at making notes on her deliveries, which is a very important thing I would advise people when you're delivering mocap, don't just send a folder, go, here you go, good luck, you know, put some notes. You know, she was like, oh, you know, this one here, the hand, I noticed the hand needs um, intersection, I've smoothed it out, but you're gonna need to do some work. And it's great for me to know, oh, okay, well, I know this stuff needs work, I can pass yeah. it on to Andrea while I work on the other mocap. So it really is dependent, but, um, I would advise you not to do crazy long takes because that means your processing mm -hmm. time will take a while. And the poor person that's going to do the processing is going to curse you. So keep it nice and short. And again, that's where the shot list comes in. That's where editorial comes in. If you have an editorial mind, you know exactly what you need. You, you know, if you're doing, if you want to do another version, just do another take. 
but don't try not to put it in one. That's what I find in a way. Yeah. Well, Alan will have some nice news for you uh, when we close off uh, in a minute. So uh, keep uh, keep looking for that. Um, so another question that we had is, uh, so you're using the Accent cloud services to collaborate on uh, mocap. Do you think this will become more standard in the future? Um, I think I think it's become it will become standard as an option that you have. I think that's the thing. Like, we, now, I didn't even know about it until I spoke to the amazing team at Accent, who were like, "Hey, you know, we have this." I'm like, "Really?" So I think once that becomes a bit more exposed and more used, and there's more cases using it. Um, I think that will become like an option like, hey, should we get a mocap suit? Should we yeah. use Motion Cloud for this? Um, and I think, yeah, because look, everyone's working remotely these days and you know, teams are working remotely and cloud is becoming an integral part to every tool set and pipeline now. So yeah, I think it'll become standard in terms of an option for sure. Good, good. Well, there's a lot of work to be done obviously, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll get there. Um, so, Another question is, do you, I mean, especially on the, the remotely directing side, do you believe that although being a negative thing, uh, COVID-19 had a positive impact on, you know, being able to do these things and kind of being enforced in, in, in doing remotely uh, directing and all that stuff? Absolutely. And you're right. It, it is an unfortunate event what's happened. But, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I had this conversation with someone else the other day that even film executives, you know, usually I would take flights to Los Angeles just to meet an executive to have a conversation, by the way, over coffee, right? Because that's just the way it works. It's a traditional legacy, like, you know, you've got to come to the Warner Brothers lot to have a conversation. Now it's like, no, let's have a Zoom call. Um, and I think it's open the mind knowing, I mean, look, Zoom has been around for a long time, right? I mean, you know, like Skype mm -hmm. has been around for a long time. is isn't a new thing, but I think it's a mentality thing like, oh, you know, we can do this and there isn't any disruption. You know, even the idea of like, I remember like telling people, like, oh, I've got a company. Oh, where's your office space? Oh, no, no, we're all working remotely. Oh, it's not really a company yeah. then, is it? <laughs> oh, yes, it is a company. We have employees. <laughs> we have financing. I don't want to pay a big OPEB, but now it's become a norm. Oh, okay. Like, you know, what time is good to jump on a Zoom or Microsoft Teams? So yeah. I think it's educated people a lot. But also mm -hmm. producers, you know, where my producer hat means, and I, set, and I touched on this on my session, means that I can really pick to work with people I genuinely am fan of. Yeah, I'm a, I was a huge fan of Mark Cheng's work. Mark Cheng is his, um, he's doing shots for us now. But you know, I remember following him on on like you know on Facebook and stuff. And when I put a post out say, hey, we're recruiting artists, doesn't matter where you are, it's all remotely. He sent his stuff in. I'm like, oh my God, like I'm a fan of your work. I get to work with you. As opposed to like the, the traditional mentality where you, know, you have to be at a certain location because of tax break purposes and all of that. And that's still, by the way, the whole tax breaks incentive still comes in play with remote work as well. Like for example, we, if we work with people in the States, then we can't utilize our UK tax incentives. Mm. So we have to balance that. But it means I can pick exactly the right person for the job as opposed to the right person that has the skill set. Yeah, oh, I can imagine. Definitely, definitely. Um... You're actually getting compliments on the the energy you're uh, sending out, so that's a, <laughs> that's a really good thing. So cool. they're asking as well: Do you ever wear this suit yourself, or do you just leave that up to the performers? Oh man, if I was to get into a suit, well, we're we'll getting a different movie. Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't got into the suit yet, and I say yet because I do plan on because, like, I don't know if you know, I love moving my hands around. But um, no, I tend to like let the performers do their thing. Yeah. You know, they're the professionals. Um, I always, like I, I was showing you, like, yeah, this is the crap version of what I'm trying to do um, to the better version. But um, yeah, who knows? Like, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a future where, you know, we're going to be directing in VR one day where I put on the suit to, to go as my avatar in, in the VR world, in a virtual set. People all around the world are, are, are piping in. You do, your, you do your whole directing in the suit. You finish, wave your hand, high five, virtual high five. And you take the VR headset off, and like, your movie's in a can. You know that's what I'm seeing in the future for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, do make sure that uh, if you do jump in the suit one day, we always say Pixar didn't happen. So make sure you send some over uh, when that true, day comes. True. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think the four last question is: uh, So what's next after? Oh, another question is already getting in. Uh, so what's next after Rift? Well. We've got a couple of projects we can't announce yet because of you know, NDAs and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool, and you may have, you're going to see an announcement probably first week December. We're announcing the video game trailer, um, and that was something that came out of 
the question of what's next for us. You know, there was that question, like, what do we do after this movie? And we're like, well, there's so many things in the movie I want to do, I can't do in a 90 minute linear format movie, right? So, and you're dealing with the con with the concept of multiverses, right? And there's so mm -hmm. many things I want to do where branch narrative storytelling is perfect. But hey, you know, we're not game developers. I used to work in games back in the day, like PlayStation 1 days, but that doesn't mm -hmm. make me a game developer. But what we did was we did a game jam session with Sam Rebello, who's our um, environment artist who happens to be a game coder as well. He makes game levels and game jams as he does. We knocked up a prototype over a weekend, a very rough one, but instantly we're like, we can do things with the story here, with the characters in a whole different way, yet still use all the same assets we've built, all the same motion capture that we've done, by the way, can still be reused. We're like, hang on a sec. We don't have to worry about the things that usually cost or takes a lot of resources, which is the art, you know, the, the assets, the motion capture. And so on. even the voices we're using, we can focus on gameplay, game mechanics. So yeah, so the next thing we're doing is um, an arcade style third person shoot 'em up of Rift where you know you had to protect the kid but also you get to tap into the kids abilities as well so look out for the announcement trailer which is going to go on a pretty well-known game site in the first week of december we'll keep our eye out for that <laughs> um let me see uh so another question what we have is will virtual production be ever obsolete or will it keep advancing in the near future yeah i, I think it will keep advancing because uh, it's not like mm -hmm. You know, we went through that phase where we had 3D stereoscopic, right? Do you remember that? We all remember 3D stereo, right? Well, that, yep. that had its moment, right? Everyone's like, oh, we put the glasses, that was great, okay. But that wasn't really, a, that, was, that wasn't really like a production. It was like, um, it was like a, an extra thing to, to view movies in. I think with virtual production, the reason why it's gonna keep evolving because it's so integral into the pipeline. And remember, virtual production is an umbrella term, guys. Virtual production doesn't necessarily mean, you know, Mandalorian or you know, LED walls. You know, yeah. Rift is an element of virtual production. We're using real-time game engine to create movies. We're using real-time solutions at XM Live View to do motion mm -hmm. capture. We're seeing everything in real-time. That's virtual production. So I think we're going to find things like, you know, XR, AR, VR, and all these new tech, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning. It's all going to be integrated into virtual production. Then that's what's going to accelerate it. A lot of automation is going to help massively for us. That's why I see the acceleration of virtual production. I would guess so as well, definitely. Um, so our last question, um, having your own IP is very beneficial to have the freedom to share everything you do. Is this becoming more common now the instance, uh, now for instance, Unreal and Xsense and other tools are becoming more easy and accessible? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's two things. Obviously, um, if you've got a, big studio to finance in your movie, then I'm not sure you'll be able to share as much as possible. I think what's really good about things like tools that, you know, like Unreal Engine, you know, being free to download and use, um, and then you've got XSense and all these other tools like Reillusion and so on, is the fact that you're giving the power back to the creators mm -hmm. to, without waiting for the gatekeepers to green light your idea. That traditionally, it will be the script. It will be me and my producing partner running around Los Angeles and London and every film festival, AFM, Berlin, Cannes. I've got a script. Can you, and I've got a, I've got a budget. It's negotiable, by the way. Can we go and make this? And you just go through that. And it gets so tiring. And then you do some concept art, you know, you raise some money, do some previews or pitch viz. Um, but all of that stuff gets thrown away, right? Once the movie's greenlit. Whereas yeah. I find that, you know, we're where we are now, you know, the fact that you, I can just bring up Unreal Engine, do some mocap, put together like the first bite. This is exactly how Rift happened, by the way. We did the first 10 minutes of the movie. We self finance ourselves because we didn't want to go rely on the script. We wanted to know ourselves is this going to work? You know, we like drinking our own Kool Aid here. So, right. like, you know, we, we, we did the first 10 minutes and we tested the 10 minutes. We showed it to various streamers, trusted producers, distribution companies. Say, hey, is this saleable if we do a movie like this? Because, you know, you want to know that before you go in. And to be able to be in that luxury position to do that and also release stuff online to see what the appetite is out there, it's so beneficial because then that was enough to go to a financing and say, hey, listen, we've put some stuff online. People are loving this. We've spoken to this, this, and that. And by the way, this is what this is the, what it's going to look like. Like, this is exactly what it's going to look like, but, you know, a bit better. And you get an instant yes or no. It's so much quicker to get a yes or no. Whereas before you got the script, they go through the whole script development process. And then they're like, no, it's not going to work. We've got something like this. Or can we make it like this? And you do tons of million of rewrite, typical Hollywood, right? So, um, whereas with this, you know, having your own IP, having control on how you, how you, 
how you create it, but not just control like creating it, but how you um, produce it. You know, producing yeah. is a big part of filmmaking, which is why, like, you know, I call myself a director, but on riff, I don't think I'm a director because, you know, I'm working with a bunch of people that are all contributing so much in the movie. I feel, I feel like there might be a new term for filmmaking in Unreal. You know, maybe you're just a filmmaker, you know, because like my job as a director isn't telling people necessarily what to do. You know, I direct the mocap, I direct the artist when they're building the assets, but then I go into sequencer and I feel like I'm like a composer when I'm in a sequencer, man. I'm like bringing mocap in there, bringing face mocap, moving the camera, put it in the edit. You know, most directors that do animation don't do that. They storyboard it in animatic and then the rest is on the team. So that changed mm -hmm. a lot. And that really is the whole indie ethos i think and i think you can see a lot of that i mean look alvaro is doing amazing work with his project create there are a bunch of other filmmakers that they're doing this and i think you know by the, by this time next year you're going to see quite a lot of productions that are high quality level productions that have been done by small teams and they're able to control how they're being sold how it's being marketed yeah that's huge yeah no absolutely and i think especially i mean being able to create that buzz in the market which, which makes it so powerful, especially with tools that are, I mean, cheap or, or even free to use in some cases. I think that's, uh, that's incredible. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Haas, for this amazing Pleasure. talk. Uh, I mean, I had a great day. I hope you had a great day. I think all speakers were incredible. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience, uh, but for now I would leave the word up to, uh, well, I want to give you an uh, uh, an, uh, an an outro. See ya.